I'm going to change the, the gears right now without a clutch. RST Talks. Okay, here we go. RST Talks. How many of you have ever seen a TED Talk ever in your life? Okay, good, good. If you've never seen a TED Talk, they're like 16 to 20, 18 minutes or so in length, and they're about ideas or spreading. They're usually done very, very well, and they're fun to watch. Um, two of my favorites would be uh, The Power of Why by Simon Simonek, uh, the, the Power of Vulnerability by Brene Brown, and one of my favorite TED Talks of all time. Um, I've got 99 problems. Cerebral palsy is just one of them. You can laugh. Okay, that was a fun, that was a super fun talk. It's like, okay, you got problems? Uh, come listen to me now. So um, RST talks are about biblical ideas worth spreading. And so last year we had a number of different talks and people would talk about different topics. This year will be a little bit different because RST talks this year is going to be about a movement worth spreading. Uh, the, the movement of Jesus Christ, the kingdom advancing, world changing, world transforming, life transforming, eternal movement of, of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ movement is the oldest movement in history. So you got the civil rights movement still going today. A lot of work to be done there yet. Other movements don't have such, a, such longevity. You've got uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement, which lasted, well, like six months or so. Um, you've got the Gen Z movement of wearing baggy clothing. That's one of those movements that just needs to die. <laughs> Honestly, like, you know, okay, I, please um, get some clothes that fit. So movements come and go. They come and go. But Jesus movement has lasted for 2,000 years and it will continue on into eternity. Um, it's also, also the most life-transforming movement in the history of the world. Uh, Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man Tom Holland, in case you wondered, but uh, the historian Tom Holland, who's written extensively on, on Greco-Roman history, and he, uh, he did some research on Christianity, decided to write a book about the, the history of the church. Uh, the book is called Dominion. I've read about 90% of it. Great, great book. Um, he came to faith in the course of doing research for this book, and he was quoted in an interview as saying, everything that explains the modern world and the way the West has then moved on to shape concepts like international law, concepts of human rights, ultimately they don't go back to Greek philosophers. They don't go back to Roman imperialism. They go back to Paul. His letters, along with the four Gospels, are the most influential, the most impactful, the most revolutionary writings that have emerged from the ancient world. He's saying all these ideas that we take for granted, like equal rights, okay? like, like, like uh, the fact that we're all equal before a, a living God, male, female, Jew, Gentile, regardless of our race, creed, color, we're all equal. Ideas like that, they go back to the Gospels and to the writings of, of Paul. And so here's a few statistics about Christians. Uh, in our country, Christians are 2.5 times more likely to adopt than non-Christians. Um, Christians are twice as likely to volunteer for a nonprofit than non-Christians. Christians are 25% more likely to give to the poor than non-Christians. 58% of the homeless shelters in, in our country are funded and volunteer-led by, by Christians in our country. Not one-fifth of all hospitals in our country are run by Christians and Christian organizations. And then many of the great movements in history, if you trace back their, their foundation and their, their beginnings, uh, the civil rights movement, um, the women's suffrage movement, the abolition of slavery, you can trace those back to Christian ideas and Christian leaders who led those movements. So I agree with Tom Holland that the movement of Jesus Christ is the most world-transforming uh, movement that has led to more human flourishing than any other movement in the history uh, of the world. But it's also the only movement that is eternal in nature. So Jesus uh, made this audacious claim about the eternal nature of his movement in John 3.36. He says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. His movement is that consequential. It's as stark as, as life and death, heaven and hell. He says, follow me, I'll give you heaven now, eternal life now, and on into the future. Your best life you can, beyond what you can possibly imagine. Don't follow me, and, and you are in an irreconcilable relationship with God, and there will be consequences that ensue. It's pretty consequential, wouldn't you say? This is the movement of Jesus and RST Talks will be about this movement, the most important movement worth spreading, the kingdom advancing, eternal, life-changing movement of Jesus Christ. So here's how we're going to roll the next few weeks, uh, three-week series, Acts 19 the whole time. And uh, the reason we're staying in the book of Acts is because if we don't continue, we'll be in it forever. So we want to finish the book of Acts sometime. Hopefully in the fall, we're going to start picking up the pace and taking like whole chapters or two or three chapters at a time pretty soon. But Acts 19 is a very important chapter. It's the third missionary 
journey of Paul, and it's where this movement begins to explode. So today, Acts 19, 1 through 10, uh, beginning in verses 1 through 2, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them? No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So uh, Paul goes from Corinth. He's in Ephesus, modern-day Turkey, and he comes across a, a small handful of new followers of Jesus, Jewish men with their families who'd begun the journey of following Jesus, and he's trying to figure out if they actually are Christians or not. So he's asking some diagnostic questions, one of which is, have, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they're like, who dat? <laughs> Never even heard there's a Holy Spirit. He's like, okay, we, 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 we got some work to do here. Um, and the same would be true of, of some of you. Either you're exploring Christianity and you're like, never heard of the Holy Spirit. Or you've been following Jesus for a while and perhaps you've never really understood the Holy Spirit. Like Some kind of ghost out there, what is that? So we've done seriousness in the past. We can't go too deep on this topic right now uh, because of our limitations of time. But uh, the most simple way to think about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is Jesus continued. The Holy Spirit is Jesus continued. Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John 16, 13 through 14, uh, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So Jesus is saying the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the, the reason the Holy Spirit uh, exist is to glorify Jesus. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit exists to glorify the Son, the eternal Son of God. And the Holy Spirit exists for Jesus to teach us what he would teach us if he was walking right next to us on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis. Have you ever wished like, you could just like walk along with Jesus and you could talk to him and say, hey, Jesus, what should I do about this? Or how do I think about that? Or what would you do if you were me? Have you ever, anybody ever wished that? Happened to them? Okay, okay, oh, five of you, thank you. Um, man, it's good to be in church today. Um, yeah, well, according to Jesus, that can happen because of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, I need to leave because if I don't leave, the, the era of the Holy Spirit can't begin. You know, Jesus could only be with a handful of people, but with the Holy Spirit, Jesus can be with all of us at the same time in this very immediate, moment-by-moment, intimate relationship. Hey, have you ever felt like you're, you're in a, like a knife fight? You're, you're fighting lies. You're fighting things going on in the culture. You're anxious. You're facing temptations, perhaps addictions you can't seem to defeat. You're, you're in a spiritual battle. You feel like you're in a knife fight, and all you have is like a banana. You ever feel that way? Yeah. The, the Holy Spirit wants to give you the power to overcome the lies, the, the narratives that, that the enemy wants to use to keep you from flourishing as a person. Holy Spirit wants to give you the power to overcome temptations so that you can become holy, Holy Spirit, holy like Jesus. Is that good news? You guys need some good news today, I think, right? Okay, there you have it. Um, here's some more. Acts 19, 3 through 7. Uh, then what baptized, did, baptism did you experience? This is Paul talking again. Uh, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. And Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So again, he's trying to figure out, do they really know Jesus? Have they experienced Jesus? Have they truly been like converted, born again, redeemed? Like, is the Spirit in them? What are they lacking in their teaching? And he's realizing, okay, they're they're probably not Christians yet. I'm going to keep helping them. We need to talk about baptism because they'd been baptized in the name of John. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Repentance means you're going this direction and you you have a new change in thinking and behavior. It's followed by behavior. And so John was saying, hey, the Messiah is coming. The way you're thinking about the Messiah needs to change. The way you're living right now needs to change in light of the fact that the Messiah is coming. And then Jesus' baptism was about the fact the Messiah had come. And so Paul's saying, oh, you just heard about John's baptism. Hey, let's talk about this other baptism. Baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and and the Holy Spirit. And so he explains the gospel more fully, and then they get baptized. So we have a baptism today. I know that because I've heard it three times in the announcements. Uh, Baptism today, we've been seeing lots and lots of people get baptized. And and we've been 
like watching how significant this is in the lives of disciples in our church. Like it's a really defining moment in a person's journey with Jesus. And so uh, when a person gets baptized, they're saying, Jesus is not just my savior, okay? I get to go to heaven when I die. I get to experience the Holy Spirit and some heaven now. No, no, Jesus is my Lord. And as I follow him as Lord, I believe my life's gonna get better and better and better because Jesus is just that good. If he would die for me on the cross, I can trust him with every area of my life. And so they're saying when they go in the water, I'm immersing myself, not only the salvation of Jesus, but the kingdom of Jesus. He's my king. He's my Lord. Okay. And then as we talk to people who are like, ah, I like Jesus. I'm a fan. I'm becoming a follower, but I'm not ready to get baptized. Usually the thing below the thing is there's some area in a person's life before they get baptized for like, I think I can trust him with a lot of areas of my life, but there's this one thing or these two things. I'm not sure I can trust him with my money. I'm not sure I can trust him with my sexuality. There's something holding people back where they go, I just don't know if God's that good yet, if I can really trust him in that area. So if that's you, um, I would encourage you to maybe let our baptisms today and communion today be a time of examination where you get honest with yourself and you get honest with God and you say, God, is there some area in my life where I'm just not willing to trust you yet, that you're that good, I can trust you. Okay. Let's continue. Um, verses 8 through 10. And then, by the way, go to the baptism afterwards. We're going to celebrate. We're going to party. Okay. Uh, 8 through 10. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, uh, this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia, this is significant, heard the word of the Lord. Okay, let me unpack this because this is actually very, very remarkable. So Paul's MO, and we've seen this throughout the book of Acts, is he comes into a city, usually for a few weeks or a few months, and, and he goes straight to the synagogue. That's where Jewish people would, would gather and they would like worship and read the Torah together and discuss the Torah. And he would go there and he would... Uh, talk about Jesus. He would talk about the Messiah that he believed had come and had died from the, on the cross and, and then forgave sin, made reconciliation with God possible, made the kingdom of God possible to enter into right now. Then he rose from the dead to prove that he really was God and he can raise us up at the end of times. So he would preach this and preach this and preach this. And, and he, he would go to the synagogue first because that's like the low-hanging fruit. Like people who already believed in God were there. They knew the Torah. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Torah. And so usually a few people, a few Jewish people would begin to follow Jesus. In the case of Ephesus, there were, there were like 12 men who began to follow Jesus. And, and then uh, usually then he'd get kicked out. <laughs> like, like eventually they'd get tired of him. they go, we don't believe this stuff, and so get out of here. And then he would go to the Agora, which was the marketplace, and there he'd start preaching the gospel to, to Greek and Romans and you know, Gentiles. And then more people would come to faith. And then he would train them. And so usually, again, he'd go for a few weeks to a few months in a city this time, he stays for at least two years, it says in the text. Scholars believe he was actually there for up to three years. And there was a lecture hall there, think school. And, and often schools would be named after a particular teacher who was very famous, very popular. Just so happened, there was this guy named Taranis. We have no idea who this guy was. But he had a lecture hall. He had a school. And uh, we know from, from some extant copies of old manuscripts of, like, history at that time that, uh, that Paul would teach from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m at the lecture hall of Toronto. So what was he doing? Uh, he wasn't doing evangelism. It wasn't his place to like share the gospel. He did that out in the marketplace. Disciples would come for training. The word here actually means training. He would train them. We can sort of speculate. He was helping them understand the implications of the gospel for every area of life, what it meant for ethics and morality, uh, marriage and raising kids and working and the marketplace, etc. cetera. He, he taught them about spiritual warfare. Because, you know, they were, they were more aware spiritually. There's a war going on than we typically are in our Western world today. He would teach them how to make other disciples. He, he would teach them how to lead house churches and how to multiply house churches. And so after being there for two years, uh, Luke is telling us here that, that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. There were 250,000 people in Ephesus. But then you've got Asia. Let's talk about Asia. Uh, we think of Asia, you know, Far East. Uh, Asia back in those days was modern-day Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and I, my, I think it's Bulgaria, something up there. I missed that day in geography, but I think it's Bulgaria. Um, 
Two million people heard the word of the Lord in a two to three year period of time. Is that remarkable? That, that my friends, is a movement of God. That, that's what happens when everyday disciples like us, we, we hear about the gospel, we receive the grace and the, the promises of God. We begin to put into practice the ways of Jesus. We obey his commands. We live them out. We faithfully share what he's taught us with other people. Because in the kingdom economy, everything you get has been meant to be given away. And, and we make disciples. And then we have simple churches that start simple churches. What can happen is you can reach a lot of people in a short amount of time. And that's what happened with Paul. Is that cool? Pretty cool. Okay, I want to talk about uh, our movement briefly um, and the power of multiplication. So if you need a restoration, like, what is this church all about? Um, a little bit of history for, uh, of, of us. Uh, we'll be 12 years old next November. And uh, uh, when we started this church, the Spirit led us to be a church that reaches people who don't know Jesus and to make disciples. I had been a part of a church that grew very large, and I would give us uh, that church an A for reaching people and about a D to D minus in terms of making disciples. The Holy Spirit said, make disciples, make disciples. And then the Spirit said, plant churches. So for about 10 years, we were starting churches like this. In my head, a church was, uh, you got to have a building, you got to have a pastor and a band, and then preferably like a, a, a hazer, a fog machine, because you can't <laughs> worship without fog machine and lights and crap. So, so we've started 46 of those churches, okay, and, uh, and they've done well. But we've not even come close to keeping up with the population growth of, of our city. And, and then COVID hit. And, uh, man, that was rough on all of us, wasn't it? And I know we're not all the way out of it, but, man, uh, every sector of society was hit. Let me tell you a little bit about my experience with COVID. Uh, when, when, it, when it happened, uh, we, we had to pivot to being a digital church, like, overnight, and by the grace of God, we had already just ordered some new cameras. We didn't know we were going to need them as much as we did. Uh, and I told my pastor friends, like, like, dude, we, we got to do church a whole new way. Like, we just lost the queen on the chessboard Sunday mornings. Like, what do we do? And so we're all trying to figure this out. And then thank God for Gen Zers with baggy clothes. Because <laughs> if, if, they, if we had not had so many Gen Zers in our church, we would not have made that pivot. So can we thank Zach and other Gen Zers in the room? who like helped us survive this shift to being a digital church. And, and to this day, we, we're about 50-50 digital physical. Uh, we're not all the way back to our physical attendance numbers yet, but we're getting close. And thank you for Church Online for watching us. But there are about as many people watching as there are like coming physically. So we kind of made that shift. And for me, it was brutal. As a communicator and as a pastor, it was brutal. I'm a people person. I like seeing faces, you know, so I can like, figure out what people might be thinking as I'm talking. I love people, okay? And I had to preach to a camera. The first seven weeks, I was the only communicator, and I hated it because I'd go home and watch it. And let's just be honest about church online, okay, church online friends. Like, it's hard to worship online. It's hard to get, you don't want to hear yourself sing, okay, because that's embarrassing, you and, you and your dog, whatever. And then you get interrupted constantly. I went, I did it with my sister and my family. Like, the microwave's going off, the dog's kicking over coffee. You know, you can't concentrate, but if you're the communicator watching yourself communicate, it's like watching plaque grow on teeth while you're constipated. It's that bad. It's like, it's boring. It's, it's boring. It's painful. You're like, oh, the whole time. It's horrible, horrible experience. Anyway, that was, that was my experience. Um, but then I got over myself, and I kind of got over the fact, hey, we're going to be here in this digital space for a long time. Thank God for cameras and Zoom and all that stuff. And, and then, you know, life slowed down a little bit. And I had time to think, and my pastor friends had time to think. And so I started calling my pastor friends up. And I go, hey, what, what's this doing to you? Like, how are you thinking about your church now that, you know, you're not meeting? And, and um, how do you think about, like, your level of discipleship was my most pointed question. And um, I'm friends with all the big churches in town. I've learned you don't talk to lead pastors because lead pastors lie like crazy, okay? You, you talk to campus pastors and staff members if you want the truth. So I'd call up my campus pastor friends and I'd go, hey, how are your small groups doing at discipleship? And everyone said the same thing. They're pretty good at care, but we suck at discipleship. And so I realized, I go, man, we're not getting the job done. Like we're filling seats and we're taking offerings, we're buying buildings, and people are like, you know, these little care groups, but they're not, we weren't hearing stories. We had 55 small groups. We were not hearing stories about life change. 
We weren't hearing stories about radical repentance. We weren't hearing stories about people like really paying the cost of discipleship. We weren't hear, hearing stories about marriages being saved. We certainly weren't hearing stories about like people sharing their faith. And we weren't hearing stories about people discipling other people. And so we just go, man, we got to pray and we got to seek God. We have a chance right now to like breathe and, and you know, listen, listen. And so uh, some of us on staff, we, we began to read about like movements around the world. I kept hearing story after story about like really deep discipleship taking place in third world context and, and this deep discipleship leading to house church movements where they just multiply, kind of like we just read about in Acts chapter 19. And I'd read about these movements and I'd heard about some of the principles, but I didn't know how to do it. And so I read this book called Tea for Tea by Yin Kai. And uh, in about 10 years, his movement a uh, Chinese American went to China. His movement grew to five to six million people in, in like 10 to 12 years. And it was the first book that I read where there was like, here's some tactics. Like this guy actually tells you like what he did. You know, lots of prayer, certain kinds of Bible studies, three-third process, more on that in a second. And, and uh, I go, let's just try this. So we did them on Zoom. We had a few. Uh, we spent a lot of time like creating groups with non-Christians. And we saw in about 18 months, we saw 100 people get baptized. And I was like, pfft. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Like, forget buildings. Let's just do this, you know. And, um, and then the, the groups that were forming, we started noticing that they were, like, falling apart. We had, some continued, but they kept, like, falling apart. And I was like, we got to learn more. And um, we, we began to, you know, meet people and read more about movements. And then God brought a man into our life named Curtis Sargent. I'm not going to put his picture up because he wants to be invisible. This is a guy who's had a huge impact, and he wants no one really to know him. Um, he's very reluctant to even put video on, online for people to learn from him. Uh, Curtis, in the 90s, uh, went to Henan Island off the coast of China as a very shy missionary. He has Asperger's. He's like Elon Musk, only he's like super nice. Um, I shouldn't have said that. Did I say that? I don't know. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. But like a Christian Elon Musk. How about that? Uh, and so uh, he goes to this island, which is like 0.1% churched. And uh, five years later, 1.5 million people were following Jesus. Curtis would just, you know, he, he'd learn the language even. He'd learn the language talking to little kids and older people. And he just would faithfully lead a person to Christ, disciple them, help them start a little house church. And this kept happening over and over and over again. In five years, 1.5 million. And so like, okay, whatever you did, we want to know how you did that. And so we had a training. Uh, Jude was there. 27 of us went to this training. Curtis was kind of to fly in and, and, and like just teach us like how he does movement stuff. And super humble man can hardly say the name Jesus without crying. That's, that's the level of holiness and humility this man has. We were, we were uh, more drawn to him than we were the concepts, even though the, those were important. So we began to do like the stuff that Curtis taught us. And, and we began to see incredible fruit and we continue to this to this day uh, before I show you like a map of our like movement and give you some idea of, of the scale of this movement uh, people ask me all the time what's the difference between a small group and a simple church and so I get a little formula for you um, small groups are typically about care and knowledge and they tend to be more inwardly focused so, and I'm big on small groups. I've been in small groups for decades. Nothing wrong with small groups. They're awesome for their purpose. So you get together with people and you care for each other. You share prayer requests. You encourage each other. You go through a hard time. You, you, know, you rejoice with those who rejoice. You weep with those who weep. Uh, sometimes you'll you know, bring flowers if someone passes away. You get meals if someone has a baby. You do that care thing. And groups are great for that. And then <clears throat> when you're in the Bible study part of it or the book you're reading, it tends to be very knowledge-based because Christians in the West, we love knowledge, don't we? We love to know new things, but we aren't so great at putting things into practice. So most of the small groups I've been a part of, you talk and talk, and you know, you, there's that one person that always shows off the fact they know more than anybody else. And so you always have that person in the group, and they make you all feel like, you know, shame, stupid, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so knowledge. And then they tend to be inwardly focused. So rarely do they talk about, hey, let's go out and let's, let's help people who are hurting. Let's share our faith. Let's start new new groups and disciple people. Some do that. Some do that. But the vast majority, in my experience, do not. Okay, So that's a, that's a small group. Um, don't want to diminish their importance, but that's what we kept bumping into. A simple church is about care. 
So if you come to a simple church, there's a three-third process we go through. So the first third, we just hang out and we, um, like my simple church met this week, we usually have really good food and we uh, drink really good wine because we have some people who know their wines. And, and, and so we hang out and then uh, we, we share prayer requests and we catch up with each other, encourage each other, and then uh, we, uh, we talk about the prayer requests from the week before, how those go. And then usually there's a little bit of accountability. And the more the simple church matures, the more there's accountability. Hey, last week when we were in the Word of God, you felt like the Spirit was saying this to you. You're going to try to change an attitude or forgive somebody or, uh, you know, um, identify with someone at work that you're a follower of Jesus, whatever it was, you know. How'd that go? And usually it's a great big, no shame, just usually celebration. Or if you didn't do it, hey, let's just try again next week. We'll be praying for you. Okay. That's the first third. Then we get into the Word of God for a while. And a little bit of content, not a lot, but a strong focus on, you know, lots of practice and application and obedience. And so we, we listen to the Word of God, we talk about it, and we try to come up with some applications, and we typically write those down and talk about them the next week, the first third. And then uh, the last third of the time together, we, we get externally focused, and we go, hey, how can we make disciples? How can we share faith with other people? Uh, can we start some more simple churches? Do we have the beginnings of a simple church among our friends, and we can help them have a spiritual family? Because that's what a, spiritual, uh, a simple church is. It's a spiritual family. Can we have other people experience a spiritual family they gather with and they, they love each other, hold each other accountable, obey the word of God, and grow spiritually? So that's what we do. Well, let me tell you what's happened over the course of the last two and a half years. Um, this represents a whole lot of relational stewardship that goes back 10 years. But I'm going to show you our gin map. A gin map is a lot like, um, a lot like trying to find a seat on a Southwest Airlines flight. So, you know... <laughs> You know, over, you want to sit like here or here where you got more leg room. Uh, but anyway, uh, all of these, these dots represent the name of a leader that's in our database. These are real people with real names that lead simple churches. Uh, about two-thirds of these come out of Jay Tinra's movement. Uh, he was at the last service, part of our church. And so it's made up of lots of refugees and, and immigrants. And that, his movement's just exploding. Um, these two dots here at the top. Uh, that would be Jason and Molly's Simple Church, and it would be uh, our Simple Church, the one that I'm in with my wife and our friends, that are some of whom are here today. And then we've got these second-generation Simple Churches. So what we did is some of us, we discipled people, and we helped them start Simple Churches. And uh, that's Gen 2. And then you see it starts to really take off at Gen 3 for us. Uh, again, our movement's not that old, so Gen 3 is really, really growing. And so these people disciple these people and help these simple churches start these simple churches. And now Gen 4, it's starting to grow. And we've got some that go all the way to Generation 7. People have discipled people and started simple churches to the seventh generation. There are 525 simple churches that are represented by those dots. We have all these in the database. But we're finding out all the time we can't keep up with this. It's really hard to keep up with this. I, I gave a little tiny bit of training to uh, a guy in Texas. I like tell him about three-third process. Here's how you do a simple church. Uh, talk about soap, so we read the scriptures and apply it to your life. Give him like two or three tools. I called this week. I go, bro, how's it going down there? And he goes, well, I got 10 simple churches. It's like, holy smokes. They're not even in the database. So this thing, when it starts to go viral, it can just take off, which is what we read about in Acts chapter 19. So church family, is that cool? Can we put our hands together to the glory of God? This is God's movement. He's been doing that. So I, I want to put flesh in this for you a little bit. And uh, the way we do that is we share stories. So this is the story of, of uh, Molly and Helen and Cassie and how they've been discipling one another and starting simple churches that are starting simple churches and they're multiplying disciples. Hi, I'm Molly. I grew up in Wisconsin and I did not grow up in a Christian home. My name is Helen Cave. I grew up in Augusta, Georgia. I'm the oldest of seven in a big family. And I grew up um, in a Christian household with some really faithful parents that raised me to know God. My name is Cassie Little. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I was raised in a Christian home. It wasn't until I was a little older that a mentor of mine shared Jesus with me and it changed the trajectory of my life. Um, I put my faith in Jesus and this amazing woman, Linda, she started discipling me. She taught me how to read the scriptures, how to pray, um, how to share my faith with those that I love most. And 
Um, since that day in my heart, I have just had a desire to make disciples, to, to share what I have learned with other people. I first met Helen at a happy hour. So we had just, um, I moved to Denver and started the Brook. And before I moved to Denver, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know what this ministry God was calling uh, me to help start was going to be like, but there's one thing I did know. I was just praying for faithful women that God would bring into my life. It wasn't until 2020, when I was about 30 years old and was going through a pretty challenging time, that the Lord resurfaced the vision of discipleship as my our greatest calling in life. Helen was one of the first women that I met, and she um, she just lit up. When I met her, she, there was a glow about her. Helen had just recently come out of a very, very hard, hard time in life. Yeah, I was actually, had gotten out of a pretty uh, challenging relationship, and it was at the start of COVID. So I was pretty isolated, living alone, working at home, like many of us. No mistake, I, I genuinely felt like the Lord was answering prayers when, I discovered the brook on Instagram and was persuaded through reading the comments that this was an undercover discipleship program. At that happy hour, we got to connect and it was just the beginning of this friendship that formed over time. Soon after meeting Helen, I just knew she was this faithful woman that I have been praying for. I invited her into a discipleship group with some other ladies and we met every other week and we would talk about um, what it looked like to follow God personally, what our prayer life looked like, um, what it looked like to be in community with believers, and then what it also looked like to take what we were learning and pass it on to others. And I saw Helen go out of those groups and start a group of her own. I saw her start um, like loving on girls and leading them. I love this um, this acronym that I heard a couple years ago. It's called the FAITH acronym. And um, Helen ex exuberates this idea of faith. Helen, she works a full-time job. She's amazing. She is one of the smartest women I know. She gives her all and then she gives more, but she still made herself um, available to connect because the thing that she valued most in life isn't job, career, success. It is, it is Jesus and it is making him known. I met Cassie at that first happy hour too. She, um, and it's funny because if you know Cassie, she has this glow about her. Kind of one of those glows where you're like, I would love to be your friend. Can I be your friend? I don't remember our interaction too well besides her stopping me as I was leaving with the guy I was dating at the time. Just she wanted to get my name, make sure I like felt known and connected. Um, when I met Helen, I was in a season of life that quite frankly, I was not bearing fruit. Faith was like a part of my identity surely, but it wasn't a part of my lifestyle. And getting to know Helen, she, without like any judgment or conviction, started revealing parts of my life that were actually hindering me from bearing fruit. A big one was my relationship. It like got to the point that the guy I was dating said, every time you come home after being at Helen's, you try to end things with us. She was in one of the first simple churches that I led, and she was one of the most faithful people to show up. The season of life she was in when I met her was really a challenging life, and the stakes were high to obey. I watched her like faithfully press into the Lord and obey Him. Honestly, it was one of the most exciting and rewarding things I'd ever seen and just made me want to spend more time with her. I didn't realize that discipleship was really what was happening in my friendship with Cassie till a little bit later. I realized that often when I would um, share scriptures or encouragement with friends, you know, we're busy, we have a lot going on. Some people take or leave it. But Cassie was so faithful to apply it to her life. So I just remember that season of like going to Helen's, feeling like the weight of both my sin and the longing that I had for a life that like abided in Jesus and like bared fruit. And I think the way she lived her life, both in like her unbelievable discipline to obey the Lord, um, the joy that she had despite her hardships that she had recently experienced and more ongoing hardships that she had shared with me gave me a taste of the life that I like wanted that didn't have yet. Throughout our relationship and like throughout the like steps of obedience that I was like taking, I felt like my life like only got harder. 
One of the things that was most meaningful to me in my relationship with Molly was that she was available and cared about my needs and cared about me as a friend, but really didn't try to help me out of her own like earthly wisdom. She was so faithful to point me to scripture. She was the one who told me, I'll never forget it, God's word disciples, not me. And she would start to share scriptures with me in our time together that I would then be able to take home with me and meditate on and, and allow the Holy Spirit to teach me through those. She has been a joy to um, lead as I have discipled her and now as being a friend because she wants her heart so much to align with the Lord's that um, seeing her receive um, the words that I've shared, shared with her through the scriptures and seeing the way that she has just clung on to them, taken them and passed them down to others has been a complete joy in my life. I remember vividly in some of my conversations with Cassie and some of the hardships she was going through at the time, feeling so aware of my inadequacy. Like I wanted to be able to fix it and like heal it and I knew I couldn't. I started sharing scriptures with Cassie that I thought she, where I thought she might be able to experience like the presence of God if she would like meditate on them. And, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was giving me these verses for Cassie. So I called her and we talked on the phone and it was nine scriptures. I don't know that I really expected her to like even read all of them. And then in the, in the weeks to come, I think it was the next week, Cassie shared that she had basically studied all of them. She wrote them all down and studied and prayed through all of them. Thank you for Helen. In a time I needed it most, she has been a rock for my spiritual development. Thank you for showing me how much I matter to you through her. In her time with you, she has heard you speak these passages for me. Help me receive what you have for me. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. I see scriptures on here. Psalm 119, 19, 25 through 32. I will run in the way of your commandments. Isaiah, Isaiah 30, verse 15. In quietness and trust, you shall be your strength. Um, there's a lot more pages like that. I don't know why it was these verses, but the Holy Spirit knew. When someone's like hurting and they're trying to be faithful, and they want to believe it's going to change, but they're just persevering and they're continuing to hurt. And you have to like point them to the promises of God that he says he will be faithful. And there's a little bit of feeling like you're going out on a limb when you're discipling someone and you challenge them to seek God with all of their heart. Without a ton of my circumstances changing, it wasn't like the Lord gave me all the things I'd been praying for, uh, except like the peace and the groundedness that I needed more than any of the circumstantial changes. I feel like it's a privilege that we get this access to the Lord through prayer. Um, but my prayer life has really changed a lot in the last two years through through knowing Helen, through praying with Helen, through um, simple church and community, and truly from like being in a place of desperation to like know the Lord and receive the Lord. Uh, I get to work with a lot of young women um, outside of restoration, and I am very aware that my story isn't unique. My biggest prayer um, and something that I feel like the Lord has used to really help me like overcome like shame or grief has been knowing that this story is going to impact and change the lives of some of those women I get to work with and I like daily pray that he would reveal to me who they are uh, so that I can like really share this intentionally um, not for like my good or my obedience, but like to glorify the Lord because I feel like He is worthy of like so much like glory and thanksgiving for how He's like sustained and grown me um, through this season. Put our hands together for those ladies. Yeah. Man, that was that was beautiful. Um, that is the power of everyday disciples making disciples for generations to come. 
I've watched that, I think, five times now. Uh, I'm starting to see the themes. I, I hear the theme of faithfulness, that they kept emphasizing just being faithful, just keep showing up and keep doing what Jesus wants us to do. Um, I heard the theme of the centrality of the Word of God. They're letting the Word of God be the place where they meet Jesus and are discipled by Jesus. And, and then prayer. Um, Cassie did a great job talking about, okay, she, it's her place now. She's looking for that fourth generation of disciples. She's praying for her friends, people that she works with. Prayer is so, so important. So if you want to be a church that joins this movement of Jesus, this 2,000-year-old kingdom advancing, life transforming, world changing, eternal movement, then we will be faithful. We'll keep the word at the center of everything and we'll pray. And if I could, if I could just like share with you what I believe is like the number one thing that every one of us could do today as we leave here today to see the movement grow, it would be to pray. I'm so grateful for Cassie's story about that. So uh, as you came in today, you uh, probably got one of these little prayer cards. You either were handed it or you are sitting on it right now. Um, if you would, please just take that out. And uh, let's do the one thing that is probably the most important thing we could do to see that the movement of, of Jesus grow in this world. Um, let's spend some time filling these out and, and let's pray. Uh, if you study movements around the world, China, India, uh, there's an explosive movement in Iran uh, you'll hear that before the movements took off, there were years, if not decades, of people faithfully, faithfully praying. Um, I've met people in our city, most of whom are older people who've been praying for decades now, that a disciple-making movement would grow in our city, that we'd see awakening, that we'd see revival. And I think we're at the beachhead of that. I think it's just beginning, but I think it's because people have prayed our movement in, into existence. And so let's take a few moments right now as the band plays. Let's fill these cards out. Um, on one side, you've got some like lists for Christians and one for non-Christians. Uh, we want to share the good news with our non-Christian friends. We want to help our Christian friends grow as disciples. We want to encourage you right now, just fill those out. Maybe you have a prayer list at home or on your phone. You already, you already do this, but maybe you just open yourself up to God putting some new names in your list. Let's take a few moments. Let's fill those out. And you may be here today and you're exploring Jesus. You might not even be sure you believe in God or prayer. Um, I can promise you that if you'll fill this list and out and pray, that it will change you. That the main person that gets changed when we intercede and we pray for others is us. As we pray for people, our heart is changed. We become more other-centered. We become more compassionate. We become more loving. Also, as we pray for people, we start to see opportunities. Our reticular activating system is used by the Spirit to start seeing opportunities to share our faith and to pour into others and, and to make disciples. So um, we do this for others, but we're also doing this for us. It's a great tool for us to become more like Jesus. Let's fill those out. Let's, uh, let's bow and pray. Let's, let's take 60 seconds or so and let's pray for the people on those lists. Let's pray that our friends that don't know Jesus will become hungry to know him, that there be a, a spiritual awakening in their hearts, a, a desire to know the grace and the truth of God. Let, let's pray for our, our Christian friends, especially those in our simple churches, our spiritual families, that, that we grow closer to each other, that we become more like Jesus, that we get deeper and deeper in the ways of Jesus. Father, we thank you for inviting us 
to be a part of the most important movement the world has ever seen. The kingdom advancing, life-changing, world-changing, eternal movement of Jesus Christ. And Father, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Please hear our prayers. Uh, please use us to be the answer to some of our prayers. Use us to help our friends come to know you, to help us pass faithfully on what you've given us to future generations of disciples. And Father, may we see a, a movement that reaches thousands, if not eventually millions in our city and our world. Uh, help us be a part of this 2,000-year-old movement of everyday disciples making disciples for generations to come. And all of this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.